Good morning. Who wants to tank their faith? That's quite an introduction. Hey, before we get to that, let me remind you that two weeks from now is Easter. Um, one of our core values is we believe um, God cares for people. People matter to God. So we want to reach out to everyone and anyone in our sphere of influence. And Easter's a great time. Uh, a lot of people are, are Christi Christmas and Easter only kind of people, and they may be in your sphere of influence, whether they're a coworker, friend. Yeah, I encourage you to invite them to uh, Easter service. That's two weeks. Um, yeah, a chance for them to be exposed to God and the gospel, and who knows what God might do. But most people say they haven't come to church because no one's invited them, surveys across the country say. So let's be people, they might say no, but let's take the uh, initiative to invite them. If you ever set a mouse trap, you know what you're counting on is that mouse gets so fixated on the food that's baiting the trap that they're unaware. And they go in and they pull that piece of candy or piece of cheese and bang, there goes the spring and they, they lose their life. Their, their, their fixation on food costs them. But we can be people who get fixated on our circumstances, can't we? We get a health issue, we get a financial issue, we get a relational issue, we get whatever it is, and it's right there and it's in front of us, and it just consumes us. And we can lose that. And I want to talk about what happens when we fixate on our circumstances. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to Genesis 16, we're going to work our way through it and ask that very question, what's the danger of fixating on our circumstances? What's the danger of fixating on our circumstances? And we're working our way. We started at the beginning in Genesis in the first 11 chapters. God created, and basically humanity pushed back. They did their own thing that was happened in the garden, Adam and Eve. Hey, you can eat from all the trees but this one, but they were, fell to temptation. They wanted to be their own God, wanted to do their own thing. And we've picked up that tendency. It has been passed on to us spiritually. You push back against God. I push back against God. To turn a phrase, all hell breaks loose. Genesis 4 was the first murder. By Genesis 6, God had said, the place is violent and corrupt. I'm sorry I made it. By Genesis 11, people want to build a tower. They can prove God doesn't there. They can run their own thing. God says, it's not happening. And he disperses them. And then in Genesis 12, he chooses to re-enter the world through a, a man and his wife. And he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. But I'm going to need you to move. I'm going to need you to go to this promised land. And you leave everything you know, you leave your language, you leave your food, you leave your culture, and you trust me, I'm going to do great things, I'm going to multiply you, and your descendants are going to be as numerous as the sand, or as numerous as the stars in the sky. And so that's where we are, Abraham and his wife Sarah have done that, but there's, there's a faith issue. And they, they took God's word and they left, but they don't have a son. They haven't been able to conceive a child together. And in Genesis 15, the chapter before this, Abram took that up with God. He said, look, I, I guess, you know, there's a servant who was born in my house, and I guess he'll be my descendant. And is, in uh, Genesis 15, 4, uh, the word of the Lord came to him, him being Abraham, saying, uh, this man will not be your heir, but he will one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And, and then he takes Abram out, and, and he shows him the stars. And it's Genesis 15, 6, it says, uh, Then he, Abram, believed in the Lord and was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abram makes a statement of faith. So that's where we are. That sets the stage for what's going to happen in Genesis 16. So here we go. Verse 1 says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she was an Egyptian. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Remember that Abram and Sarai went to the land, promised land there was a famine. They went to Egypt. They were pushed out of Egypt by the Pharaoh, and he sent them away with uh, stuff and resources and, and servants. And probably they picked up Hagar in Egypt. So, that being said, verse 2, Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And I want to stop there for a minute. It's clear. Genesis 2.24, God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman. You'll share that, that 
sexual union together. It's not to be shared outside. It, you're, you're one flesh. So, so God's plan is clear on that. Second, Abram has already made a declaration. He said, hey, God, I don't have an heir. And God said, you're going to get one. You need to trust me. And I, he shows him the, the, the stars. And Abram said it was, he believed it. He believed and it was reckoned him as righteousness. We settled that. Abram is going to believe God. But apparently not. Because his wife's saying, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is going to happen. Why don't you go in with my maid and conceive a child? Because social custom was, you have a child with a, ma- a servant in your house. That child is yours. I thought you believed God that he was going to provide a child. We had this great statement of faith just one chapter ago. What happened? Why? Here's what I think happened. It's in verse 3. Here's what I think happened. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. That's what I think happened. Ten years, no child. Man, we we left everything. We left family. We left land. We left culture. We left food. Believing that you're going to make our our, our family great. You're going to give us descendants. We didn't have a child, but but you said you'd provide one. And we believe you. We we went in faith, but ten. Waited and they waited and they waited, and at some point they thought, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen. And, and we, you know, we believe God, you know, to lead the land and stuff and do send it, but but we we uh, we better make this happen. Because it, it it isn't happening right now. So so why don't you go to uh my servant, you, you conceive a child with her, the law says that'll be our child, and away we'll go. How's that sound? How's that sound? That sound like a good plan? Those of you who've been married, that sound like a good plan? No, it doesn't. Just let me, that was a rhetorical question. It's a bad, it's a bad idea. So here we go. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife took Sarah, Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived, she has conceived a child, and when she saw that she conceived, she had conceived, her mistress, so that that Sarai, was despised in her sight. Hagar despises Sarai. I mean, that was the plan all along. Hey, we haven't had a child. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a child. Okay, I'm I'm on board. But you conceive a child... Boss, his mistress, is basically her boss. I hate you. I loathe you. Why? Because I conceived a child, and I'm going to carry this child, and this child's going to be yours. Does that, does that make sense where that might be a problem? You don't need a degree in family therapy to, to figure out that's going to be, that's going to cause tension. And I hate your guts for taking my child. That's what we got going on. A little, little stress in the house. Verse 5, and Sarai said to Abram, she's feeling it, feeling despised. May the wrong done me be upon you. Well, this was your idea. I gave my maid into your arms. When when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. I mean, you didn't think that was going to be a problem? See the child, and now the child's going to be mine? But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. Hey, you got the power here, Sarai. Don't take that from her. So, Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. But she's going with the child. That's a problem. It's a bad idea when we step out from under God's plan and God's direction, and we think we're going to do it ourselves. Why? Because they got fixated, man. God promised, but it's, it's been 10 years. We haven't had a child. We better step into this. We better do it on our own.
Verse 7, now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Shur is the northernmost part of Egypt. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. But it comes with a promise. Verse 10. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that it will be, they too will be too many to count. Makes a promise. You'll have that child, and that child will be the father of a great nation. Multiple descendants. That's who we know as the Arab world. Doesn't say God's going to give them a land. Doesn't say they're going to be a blessing to people like God promised Abram and his descendants, but does say you're going to be a mighty people. Um, verse 11. The word of the Lord, the angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son, and you'll call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And these people will be a torment. Read the Old Testament. Read, read the newspaper today. These people will be a torment to the people of Israel. But God still cares about people. People matter to God. And this is a woman in need. This is a woman in desperate situation. And God's going to step into circumstances like that. Why? Because people matter to God. And there may be people in your sphere of influence. You think they're a torment. They're this. That person matters to God. That's why you ask them, we ask you to be praying for them, inviting them, cultivating a relationship with them. What? That the Lord might work through you in their lives. Verse 12. Here's some insight about Ishmael. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. That's a tough way to live. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. What a mess. What a mess. And it's, gonna, it's a mess that will have repercussions for thousands and thousands of years. How, how'd we get here? How did it get here with Abraham, Sarai, and Hagar? Sarai and Abraham looked at their circumstances and they thought, no, this is too much for God. I, I don't, I, you know, it's, he said, but, but it's been, I've been waiting a while. I, we, we need to make this happen. Got so focused on circumstances, lost sight of God. That's a formula for disaster. That's a recipe for a mess, and that's what we've got. See, we're, we're wrestling with this question, what's the danger of fixating on our circumstances? Here's the danger. Fixing, fixating on circumstances deadens our belief in God. It dissolves. It weakens our trust in God because we get so focused on this that we forget about God. Fixating on those things deadens our belief, our trust in God. So the question I have for you and for me is, what's your circumstance? Or what are your circumstances? What is right there and you go to bed thinking about it and you wake up thinking about it? Is it a financial issue? Is it a health issue? Is it a kid issue? Is it a job issue? Are you so focused on that circumstance that you're forgetting about God? God surely can't, because it's been a long time. We've been dealing with this a long time. God surely can't be in control over that, can he? Are you waiting? It's hard waiting. And the longer we wait, the more we're tending, we tend to compromise. Maybe you've been single a long time, and you're thinking about dating someone you have no business dating. Five years ago, you wouldn't have thought about that, but man, it's hard right now. 
Or maybe you're thinking about taking a job you have no business taking. But man, it's been month to month to month to month, and it just, you're going to do it. You know, I, I'm not good at waiting. And, and I, I mean, I've got zillions of examples. But I remember the first time, um, I think it was the second time we went looking for a pastoral job. I was on staff at my church, home church in Greeley, and we decided, Hope and I decided together, this is enough. And I came home one day, and I said, hey, Hope, I just can't do it. And she said, Andy, I've been waiting for you. Talk to Pat. Tell him what you want to do. And so we agreed. We'd move on. And and we'd take, I don't know, three or four months to look. And, and I started looking. And uh, I'm a month into my job search. Just a month. And that week, I this is pre-internet. I'd gone down to the seminary. And you, they have churches that are looking. So you say, pick this one, pick this one, and, and send my resume there. Well, a year earlier, I had been in Chile, and I had started a job search, and I had sent them to some district superintendents, and then I took this job at our home search, and I got a bunch of rejection letters, but I really didn't look at them. I just kind of gathered in the thing. So all that to set up, it's Saturday night. I've been down to the seminary, and I realized as I'm going through these letters, man, I got rejected by one of the churches I just applied to this past week, and I was, I just embarrassed. A year ago, they rejected me, but, but they hadn't filled their position. Man, and I thought, I'm so glad. This is humiliating. I'm so glad. This is, I'll never see these people. And, and then I called Hope, and I said, look, this is ridiculous. I just ought to go look for another job. There is no way I'm, I'm going to get a job. There's just, I have no experience. No one's going to know me. We're only a month in. People were a month in, and a month ago, we had decided we're going to step out and trust God. And I'm telling her, we can't do it. She said, Andy, let, let's trust God. That's what she said. Let's trust God. Don't tell me to trust God. I know the Greek word for faith. Don't tell me to trust God. <laughs> as honestly as I can tell the story, the next afternoon, that church that had rejected me called. I was, it was Sunday. I'd gone to church, and I was out just processing. And they called, and they said, we're very interested in talking to your husband. And I ended up taking the job there for two and a half years. And I thought... These people, it'd be humiliating to meet them because they've already turned me down once. You talk, talk about playing hard to lose. And they're the ones that called me. And, and God, and, and I, I mean, I got a multitude of those stories, but God says, Andy, you can trust me in the waiting, but I do lousy at it. I'm broken because I want control. And I think God works in the waiting to build our faith. Because when we're waiting, there ain't nothing we can do. And we're one people who want to make it happen, don't we? Sometimes God said, you're going to wait. Abraham and Sarah, you're going to wait. It's been 10 years. You're going to wait. In the waiting, are we fixating on God or are we fixating on our circumstances? Because we're setting ourselves up for a mess. And that's what Abraham and Sarah have done. But God will prove himself faithful. Here we go. Verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. For she said, I have seen, I have even remained alive after seeing him. Hagar... I believe, saw the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The word of God showed up to her. Therefore, the well was called Beer Roy because it was between Kadesh and Berez. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Well, what about Sarai? What, what, what does, does the Bible have anything more to say about Sarai? Well, here's, Sarai made the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Here's what Hebrews 11, 11 says about Sarai. By faith, even Sarah, she got her name changed later. By faith, even Sarah received, herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Whoa, 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 this is the same woman who said, Abram, you need to go, and you need to go with Hagar. And, and she's considered him faithful, who had promised? That, that doesn't look very faithful, does it? What, what we just read in Genesis 16? What happened? Sarai grew in her faith. Sarai failed, but that wasn't failure is not the end with God. God met her and walked her where we, she was, so she grew in her faith to the point she was considered faithful that will put her in the faith hall of fame. I'm wondering, do you have any failures of faith? Because I do. And the good news is, Sarai shows God doesn't give up. 
So if you're one of those people saying, Andy, I've blown it. Well, join, man, join the club. But God doesn't give up. God's not done with you. And my hope is that, I hope you'll read this again today, this week sometime. And be reminded that, that God is faithful even where, when we're faithless. But as we face those decisions, I hope we'll, we'll remember this. And, and remember, don't make my circumstances bigger than God. But, you know, as Daniel and I put this, these service together, he reads the sermon and, and he picks songs. And, and we're going to, after we do communion, we're going to finish with a song that says, The Rock Won't Move. And maybe you failed, and maybe you, you, you got a list of failures. You want to know, know what? The rock won't move. God doesn't change. Maybe you're trying to make a decision. You don't know. I'm afraid to step out. I'm afraid to stay out. I don't know what it looks like. Whatever you do, the rock won't move. God's faithful. Maybe, maybe you've made a bad decision, or you've done something. That, the rock won't move. I hope those words will stay in your mind. Because, man, we are weak, and we are unstable. But the rock won't. Now, this is a rich metaphor, and in the New Testament, Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, and, and he picked up on this. And the Galatian, there were some people who were Judaizers who were trying to say, hey, it's really not by faith, it, it, it's what you do. And so Paul picks up on this, and, and he wants to use this as an example that we need to trust. And so I'm reading from Galatians 4, 21 to 31. Here's what he says. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, in other words, you're going to do things to work your way to God, do you not listen to the law? For it was written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, that'd be Hagar, and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Now, the flesh is, in this case, is everything we can do apart from God. And isn't that what Abraham and Sarah decided? We, we need to do this apart from God. And the son by the free woman through the promise, that, that's Isaac. This is allegorically speaking, it's an allegory. For these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, which is the law. Bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to present Jerusalem, where the Pharisees are teaching the law. For she is slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. Was that at the time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it now is. So those who are proclaiming faith are being persecuted by those who are saying, no, it's what you need to do to work your way to God. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of her bondwoman shall not be an heir, the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are children of a bondwoman, not of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. We're people of faith. And we realize ultimately it's not what we can do, but what God will do through so let, let me give two examples from my life. When I was a little boy, I loved sports. I grew early. And at 12 years old, I was really big and I could pitch really fast. And so the teams would kind of get on my case to get me wild. Because either you walked, walked or struck out. Well, this particular game, they were getting on my case. And I wasn't very smart. And I said to the bench, I looked over and I said, the next one that says something is going to get hit. That's not very smart to do. But so the guy kept mouthing off. Next batter came up, I hit him. I got thrown out of the game. My dad was livid. My dad was livid after the game. He said, look, you're suspended one game. You do that again, it's two games. You do it again, it's your season. And what he wanted to say was, I'm going to put consequences so you don't do this. That's an act of the flesh. That, and, and my dad wasn't a Christian. I, I think he did right. you got to learn consequences, son. But you know what I needed? I needed a work of the Spirit of God to ask, why does this game mean so much to you that you're willing to hit somebody with a ball? Why do you get so emotionally tied up? There's something wrong at the core. I needed a work of God to say, enjoy the game, but Jesus is more important. And if you lose, it's okay because Jesus walked. I, I had it out of perspective. I needed a work of God. And so, yeah, I had consequences. See, that's what the law does. It says consequences, but it doesn't change our heart. Six years later, I was a sophomore in college. And I, uh, this day it was about October, and I'd taken a class, third semester calculus, and I'd not done well, and it was clear I was going to get a B in the class. And man, I was bummed out at dinner. And my friends had seen this kind of, who died? Who died here? And so they found out what had happened, and, and they tried by sarcasm to say, oh, you got a B? Man, I, I dropped out of school. 
oh, I got a B. I switched my major. Not me. I, I just give up on life. You know, and they're trying to use sarcasm and humor to say, lighten up. It doesn't matter. That's a work of the law. That's something that can't. What I needed was a work of God on the inside to say, what is it in your value system that this grade means so much that you act this way? See, there's things we can do on the outside, but there's a work God needs to do on the inside. And that's our faith, that God is doing that work. We're children of the promise. We're not children of the law. We're ultimately dependent on God to do a work in our heart and our soul. So when you fail, how do you respond? You lose your temper, you, you, whatever you do. Yeah, there's some things we do on the outside, but, but we desperately need a work of God on the inside. When we focus on circumstances and what is going on, we fail to see God and what he wants to do. You know, a number of times, I, um, when kids, we would, our kids were little, we took them to the Omaha Zoo. It was one of the greatest experiences we had. It was a treat. And many of you have been to the zoo. But, but you know what would ruin the zoo experience for you? If you went there and you just focused on the animals. If you just thought, you know, those tigers and those lions, they could rip my head off. That bear, he could, with one swipe. He could, and if you got so focused on the animals, you didn't realize there's protection there. There, there. There's just safety. And many people come in and out of the Omaha Zoo and they live to, to experience it. But you get focused on, 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 on the animal, you could lose the experience. And I, I fear that's what we do in life. We get so focused on the circumstance that we forget there's a God who's in charge. Would we see beyond our circumstance so our faith would be alive to the God who's in control? You know, we're going to move to a time of communion now. So if you're one of the people that's serving that, if you would come to a table, that would be great. Um, let me tell you what we're doing and we're not doing as we do communion. We... Don't believe the, be, this becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus. This is a, a memorial. This is something we're doing to commemorate our faith. Um, you don't have to be a member of North Point to participate in communion. You just need to be a follower of Jesus. I ask you to, um, if you don't know what that means, just feel free to sit and watch. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, uh, if you guys go to these tables, the far tables, there's gluten-free wafers there. Um, as we go, let me ask, who or what are you trusting in your circumstance? You've got circumstances, don't you, that are hard? So do I. Are you so fixated on those circumstances that you're missing God? Would we see the God who's big enough? Let me pray, and then we'll celebrate this together. Lord, we're grateful for Jesus and for what he's done. Thank you for um, this example of people who failed in faith but yet were restored. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.